Hello. Today I'll briefly talk about globalization, which is an extremely complex global system, but also conceptually extremely complicated to explain in a short lecture, but I'll try my best. So generally speaking, uh, globalization is the global system within which it is assumed that the world exists under a larger structure that is similar and that is also developing similar economic regimes as well as cultural regimes. So anytime when we assume or say uh, that this is a globalized world, what we are assuming that somehow there is a single economic system that governs the world and that economic system in turn either creates a global culture, almost universal, but maybe a culture that at least shares certain traits that are similar no matter where you live. Also, it is assumed that a globalized world allows free movement of commodities, free movement of capital, and by and large, the national borders become more and more permeable. These are some of the assumptions about globalization. Now you can already discern in that the Eurocentricity of the term itself, because most of the things that are assumed about it, about mobility, about freedom to move from one, those primarily only apply to the developed world, right? by and large majority of the global population stays outside of that promise, okay? And we'll talk about that a little more. Now, before we talk about globalization as its proponents offer it to us, it's also important to understand what are the critiques and where do the critiques come from? Most of us on the left call the current regime of globalization as the neoliberal regime, right? And what do we mean by it? Now, if you look at the basic uh, assumptions behind the economic globalization of the world, those assumptions are derived from people like Adam Smith and others who were called liberal economists. So this return to Adam Smith is what we consider as a form of neoliberal globalization. And it also comes from the Chicago School and other economists. So the basic assumptions in those are, uh, which they draw from Adam Smith and then people like Milton Friedman and others work on it, is that the basic assumption about human subjectivity is that we are all self-maximizers, right? That we all seek our own self-interest. And the only thing that impedes us from seeking that self-interest is regulation, right? So if we deregulate and eliminate most of the regulations which might force us to stay at a certain place in the economy, each individual in a given economy will seek his or her own self-interest. And it's called rational self-interest too. And after we've created a society in which everyone is free to seek their self-interest, we would have thus created a society of self-maximizers, right? People who would maximize to their best abilities, and hence we will create a society or an economy which would prosper because everyone is seeking their self-interest. Now, I had mentioned in one of my books, I, I still remember the sentence that a lot of us don't realize that most of the times when we go seeking our self-interest, sometimes it's in someone else's backyard. Okay, and so in neoliberalism, there were certain other assumptions that global economies need to open up their borders, the commodities need to move freely, and each nation should develop their own niche commodities, right? Which is called comparative advantage. So look around, see what is it that the world wants from you and then build an economy around that, right? So if you are an Arab nation, uh, Saudi Arabia or the Emirates, you already have a niche market, you have oil, that becomes your comparative advantage. That's what you develop and rest of it 
can come from anywhere else in the world. You don't have to worry about agriculture because if you have one commodity or two that the world wants from you, then you can trade, right? You can raise revenue through that. Um, now, the economic globalization, as it is offered right now, then assumes certain things that goods should be able to move freely. Uh, capital should be able to move freely. And the logic behind that is that, okay, if I have extra money, you know, how do we invest? We always invest our surplus. No one invests the capital that they need. They always invest what is surplus. So the logic behind is if the rich people can have more surplus, they will invest it. And when they invest it, more jobs will be created. And because of that, wealth would trickle down. That was That is what is also called the trickle down economics. Now, I pointed it out in some of my published works as well, is that that idea of people investing their surplus capital is great, but it assumes a mode of production that precedes neoliberalism, that is of advanced capital when economies were national, right? And there were barriers to sending money abroad. In neoliberalism, capital can move freely. So if you give me surplus capital, I don't need to invest it in my neighborhood or in my own country. I can actually send that capital floating across the global markets and keep hopping the higher interest rates. Right? And that's exactly about 10 years ago, if you read Zygmunt Bauman's book on globalization, he cites the statistics that out of every $10 spent in the global market, only $2.50 produce an actual job. Most other money is making money by itself. And that's why global economy becomes speculated. speculative. So these are some of the things about economic globalization. It has still not fulfilled its promises. Right? Two, or another important thing is that what ends up happening because of this liberalization of global economies is that the labor intensive jobs are transported to the developing parts of the world, right? But when we go there, nothing new is emerging because the labor is captive, right? Sometimes it's women, sometimes it's people who don't have many rights. So you, it creates the ideal conditions for exploitation of labor without giving the labor a chance to unite, to form unions, or to ask for more wages and more rights. So the entire edifice of neoliberal economy then is built on precarity, on this idea that labor should be fixed in place, should not have many rights. I mean, think, think of China. Now, a lot of people, when I visit Pakistan, they tell me that we should follow the China model. Okay, what is the China model? I mean, think about it. Keep millions of your own people in small housing units with no rights, no rights to negotiate their own price and sell their labor through global corporations in manufacturing and anything else, right? Provide cheap labor to global corporations to sustain yourself but have millions of people almost working at slave wages. So this is the legacy of globalization, neoliberal globalization. So think of the three things that constitute any capitalistic mode of production, capital, commodities, and labor, right? In neoliberal regime, capital can move freely. You can send a billion dollars with one click to anywhere in the world. Commodities can pretty much move freely. I mean, unless you count what Trump is doing right now uh, because tariffs have been reduced. But labor is the only part of the productive process that is kept fixed. If you're a worker and you say, I want to work in the United States, you have to go get in line, apply for a visa, right? So by keeping the labor fixed wherever they is in their local communities, then 
the global powers, economic powers, can control their price. Because how does labor raise its own price? By either locating to a place where they get better wages, right? Or by coming together, unionizing, and asking for better wages. Now, if you look at neoliberal regime post 1980s, there are two things that are important, which the Europeans have done as well as the Americans and Canadians, okay? They've tried to break their unions, okay, everywhere. And two, they have increased border restrictions for people coming in. So all of these maybe unintentionally are geared towards creating a precarious workforce. Look at Pakistan, for example. Those of you who work in academia, who are part of the cognitariat, the knowledge workers, right? Majority of the universities employ what we call contract lecturers. Why do we employ them? Because we can pay them less, right? Two, they are also, their situation is also precarious. They can be told what to do, what not to do. Chances are, if you are not a fully employed government appointed professor, if you're just a lecturer, you're not going to push any buttons. You're not going to try to be united. And if you do so, they can fire you just like that. So the global labor regime is dependent on that precarity. So to sum up, neoliberal economy, neoliberal globalization is still controlled from the North Atlantic regions. Actually, Saskia Sassen, one of the persons whose books are really amazing about sociology of globalization, would tell you that 64% of the profits still go back to North Atlantic regions, right? So this spread of global economy is deeply selective and it still privileges the developing nations, right? And it increases the precarity in the developing world. Furthermore, there are international regimes that force developing nations to do certain things, whether or not they are in their own interest. You already know about IMF and I will do another lecture about that, but even things that a lot of us don't understand. I mean, I once sat in a negotiation, not a negotiation, in a discussion group in Pakistan between United States and Pakistani officials. And it was something called the US-Pakistan Education Discussion Group. And oddly enough, I was sitting on the American side, even though I was not a US citizen at that time. And what I noticed in that was that all the questions from Pakistani side were not the questions about whether they had any objection to the global copyright regime or whether they wanted a tweak. No, the questions were about compliance. Would you send us some lawyers to train our people? Would you give us more knowledge as to how we can be compliant? So the global economy, to participate in it, any developing nation, has to follow certain globally decided protocols. And if you don't do that, you don't make it in the global economy. So this is the economic system, which obviously, without a doubt, safeguards the privileged location of the North Atlantic regions. Now, what is a solution to that? I don't think so extreme nationalism is a solution to that. Maybe the solution is as people from World Social Forum, are trying to theorize, trying to write a coming together of the developing world. That's what we did in the 1970s, you know, with the non-aligned movement and everything else. But there needs to be a collective pushback. And is that possible? I don't know. I mean, we just saw uh, even the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Countries, trying to isolate another group of countries who were meeting somewhere else simply because they saw that as a threat to their own power, right? So that's something for our leaders and those of you who are interested in the future of the world to decide. Another biggest problem with neoliberal globalization is this divide between the local and global. Now remember, globalization sells itself as something universal, something that would enhance everyone's life if we followed the logic of it. 
But as Zygmunt Bauman points out in his book, Globalization, is that the global corporations, when they come in in any developing nation, they are already protected from certain local laws. Sometimes they get special deals because the developing nations are starving for investment. But also whatever destruction, ecological, economic, right, uh, infrastructural, whatever they cause, chemical dumping or whatever, they can leave. But it's the local government and local people who have to deal with the consequences. So any corporations who come in, comes in and builds a factory or maybe has a project and they use whatever they need, sometimes they can get away with using materials there that they will not be able to use in the developed world. But when they leave, and they can leave any time, the consequences of whatever they have wrought on that piece of land are always dealt by the people. They, they live with the consequences of ecological disasters. The local governments have to fill in the gaps of any infrastructural damage that might have happened, let's say if it was mining or something else. So the consequences of globalization are local, right? But the power to determine how to do things is globalized, it's international. It's governed by multinationals and the states that back them. Another thing to keep in mind also is that even though the exponents of globalization keep telling us that it is the only way forward, the balance is uneven. Okay, the way the global economic rules are made or laws are written, they absolutely favor the privileged location of the West, of America, of Canada, maybe Japan and China now, but all the developed nations are the ones whose interests are being safeguarded. And there is no doubt about that. You can read all the documents and all the international trade treaties. And it, most of the times it is these developed nations, major, most of them, the biggest economies are also the biggest polluters in the world. But somehow we are led to believe that we, the developing world is causing the disasters and you know, hurting the environment. Now, the question then that people like me ask is, is there some form of viable resistance to neoliberal globalization? Yes, I mean, there are organizations, World Social Forum, there are environmental organizations, there are national organizations that constantly remind the local leaders to safeguard for the interest of their own people. There are also in Latin America movements that constantly encourage a return to simpler ways of living, more ecologically responsible ways of living. And then there are labor rights organizations. There are organizations that constantly report if, if a multinational or if a corporation is doing something wrong. And all of these resistance organizations work in concert with each other, right? Sometimes a small organization in India can bring in a lawsuit and then the local environmental lawyers and others in the United States would help them. So there is a large web of resistance to globalization. Now, there is a certain kind of chauvinistic, nationalistic resistance to globalization, which is also developing right now in the United States. Uh, if you look at Mr. Trump's policies, right, which are very self-centered and selfish policies. What he wants is for United States to have access to the world's resources, Right? to have the right to dictate global terms. But at the same time, he wants to add protections to what people can and cannot do in trading with the United States. And he can get away with it because of the power of the United States. All of it is being done under the rubric of protecting American jobs. But the question is not whether that is right or wrong. Maybe the American jobs need to be protected. I mean, I would like the American workers to be more competitive and see if they can hold those jobs if they have to compete with the rest of the world. But uh, 
The problem is that the developing nations, the nations that don't have that kind of political and military clout cannot do that. So while United States is defining that it's not going to follow this, not going to do that, they have the power to do it. Poor nations in Africa, in Asia, do not have that kind of symbolic or material power to deny the dictates which are partially written by the United States of IMF, World Bank, and others. So the best form of resistance, in my opinion, would be knowing how globalization works, whose interest does it serve, not buy into its logic ipso facto and start implementing these policies that only benefit the rich nations, but also pose some form of resistance and also to come up with some local ways of doing things to revitalize some of the old ways in which we used to do things. And that, of course, I will leave up to you to imagine. Uh, so the question is then, how do we use this knowledge in post-colonial scholarship? So think of it what we do when we write about a novel as post-colonial scholars. If it's about the contact phase, we talk about resistance, we talk about oppression, we talk about women's rights. So increasingly, if we know how neoliberal globalization works, we can read a novel like Adiga's White Tiger or Rohintan Mistry's, uh, uh, you know, uh, A Fine Balance, or even what to do how to get filthy rich in rising Asia. All of these novels are dealing with the current economic globalized situation. And if we knew how globalization works, then we can, if we knew that labor is kept precarious, then we can read in Adinga's novel, Adinga's novel, how is labor kept precarious. Uh, we can also see in, in a fine balance, you know, how thin the margin of error is for people who are trying to make it into the global economy, right? What's the role of the middleman? What happens to the workers? What happens to the local managers? All of these things are in our stories and with some basic knowledge of how globalization works, we can employ it in our scholarship. And you are free to give me any other suggestions, but these are some of the things that I've done in my own work. So, not to belabor the point too much, to conclude, um, here's what I understand by globalization. So the claims that are made in the name of globalization are that we live in a world which is under one sort of uniform system in which a global culture is emerging, which has certain norms that everyone follows. Right? That's the story that we are told. But if you look at the world and look at neoliberalism, particularly, we, we see that the world is still divided between the rich and, and the poor, right? And that increasingly the developing nations are finding it harder and harder to develop their systems, to develop their infrastructures, because they are beholden to IMF and other institutions who would not allow them to do long-term investment in their own people. So the world that is being created is the world of precarious labor, labor with fewer and fewer rights. Uh, it's a militarized world in which security becomes the biggest issue since the nation states can no longer do welfare what they can then promise is, okay, we'll defend you from all the enemies, which then creates this cycle of creating those enemies. And some of them, sometimes there are enemies. Then there are there is rising fundamentalisms, both Christians, Muslims, uh, and others. And these are the these are anti-capitalist movements, but they are using historical ways of looking at the world and trying to transform it into something that existed in the past. All of these are reactions to neoliberal globalization. In, in my opinion, neoliberalism actually spawns these movements, creates these human subjectivities, because the nation states have sort of lost the ability to create you know, national identities in which people aspire to be members of the nation state itself. So I'm not saying that the nation state is the best, but in my humble opinion, uh, 
a civic nation state responsive to its own people in a way is the last defense against the powers of neoliberal globalization. Not a chauvinistic nation state, but a civic nation state, which is democratic, but which also wants to take care of its own people. So these are some of my thoughts about globalization and how it can be used in post-colonial theory in post-colonial scholarship. I'm pretty sure there is so much more that needs to be covered. I will put uh, links to some of the books in the description and uh, a couple of blog articles from my website, postcolonial.net. And I hope those would be useful for you. And that is all I have now. Um, uh, please do let me know if there is anything else you would like me to cover until then. Thank you so much and I'll see you later.